Uh, what a blessing. So we'll be in Colossians chapter 3, and we'll be looking this morning at verse 21. Colossians 3, and we'll be looking at verse 21. Let's read that, and then we'll pray. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning. This, now we just brought our kids, we bring ourselves, your kids, Lord, too. And we ask that you would open our hearts to hear from you through your word, Lord. Pray that you would fill each one of us afresh with your Holy Spirit, Lord, to receive what you have to say to us from your word. I pray that I don't get in the way, Lord. And, and let your Holy Spirit come just afresh right now, even. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. We live in a world, we live in a country that is slowly decaying. We live in a world that is slowly slipping into chaos as we look all around us, as, as we see so many more children uh, that are born outside of marriage today. I remember back in the 90s a show called Murphy Brown. Remember that? Anybody remember that? And, and on that show, Murphy Brown... The character on the show decided they wanted to have a baby out of wedlock on purpose to take away the stigma that was there. And I remember Dan Quell, the vice president, then spoke out against that, and he was basically almost crucified in the media as being a prude, as, you know, being mean-hearted and this and that. But in reality, what they were trying to push on us was sin and sinfulness. And a lot of people receive that in, and today more than ever, couples are living together. I think the numbers of couples under 30 years old, it's like 50 to 70 percent will live together before they get married. And what's trippy with that whole, those whole facts is that most of those marriages, they, they, then when they go on to get married, it's like 70 percent, they're more likely to get a divorce than those who never live together. When you look at the numbers, it's crazy. But we're receiving it as the norm in a way. Parents are raising children alone. And sometimes, you know, most of the times, especially within the poor communities, it's because husbands have left, you know, come in and they don't want to be a father. They don't want to support their children. They don't want to take on that role that God has ordained them to be. And so we have children that are discouraged within our culture, children that are rebelling within our culture. We, we saw that last week in Baltimore. Anybody see any of that on the news? You know, that's not just a color issue. That is a poor issue. That is a, a societal issue. We need to understand that. That as these people are raised up in mostly homes that have no fathers, again, in, in that area, some 70 plus percent have no dads in the home. Moms are working two jobs just to provide, to try and provide a place for their kids to come and, and work. So what, what does that leave? Unsupervision. Dads aren't there. And in a way, their dad's not being there, provoking their children to go out and be whatever they want. They're discouraging them. They're not being who the Lord has told them to be. Now, it is interesting, as we come here in the book of Colossians, and the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, has been giving us theology in the first few chapters. He's rebuking some false teachers that had come into the church. He's then now telling Christians about putting off the old and putting on the new. So he's giving us the theology of who we are in Christ. And then he goes on to practically tell us how to live out this faith in our lives as Christians. And if you just glance at verse, back at verse 18, he starts with, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Father, fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. So we see the progression. What I find interesting is that as he goes on to do this, the first place he tells us to practically apply it is where? In our homes, in our marriages, in our families. If we're children with our parents, if we're parents with our kids, with our wives, with our husbands, with our husbands, with our wives. And, and, and it all starts, our Christianity should not stop when we go through the door. 
It should start when we go through the door. Can I have an amen? Amen. amen. Too many of us were probably raised in homes, and not probably, but a lot of us have been raised in homes where we, you know, our parents profess to be Christians, and then they would get home, and then they proceed to get drunk. They'd be cussing and cursing and yelling and beating the kids at times and different things. The marriages are terrible. I told my wife I loved her when we got married. I don't need to tell her again. If something changes, I'll let her know. That can be the attitude within, even within Christianity. And you know what happens? If we're not living continually after Jesus, especially in our homes, we have absolutely no right to call ourselves Christians. None. I remember a friend of mine, Mark Steve, sweet guy. Um, he, he wrote, uh, It is my desire, you know, to, to love you, Lord, and some other stuff. And just a sweet man of the Lord. And he had some rough edges. And it was interesting, though, as you talk to him about the rough edges, he grew up in a home where they would go to church every Sunday. And they would see their dad going around and, oh, good to see you, brother. God bless you. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And then they'd get in the car and he'd start cursing at them. He'd start hitting them. He'd be yelling and screaming and, you know, doing, you know, little gestures with his fingers, even in the church parking lot. It's wicked. It's wickedness. A lot of us have come to a place where, you know, where we come to our homes and we treat our wives or our husbands or our kids or our parents worse than we do the people at school or our work or, or our neighbors. It is, it's the weirdest thing in the world, isn't it? We say stuff that we're, sometimes we're like, dude, I, there's no way I just said that. There's no way. It's our flesh. The key is if someone were to ask our wife, if someone were to ask our husband, if someone were to ask our children or our parents, what would they say of our claim to Christ? You ever think about that? If an investigator came knocking at your door, you ever notice how, you know, on the police shows, the investigator, they always break everybody up if you have a story, you know? You go to that room, you go to that room, and, and, and so imagine somebody comes knocking at your door. Hi, it's the pastoral police. We saw a fish on your car. We need to check with you and see where you are with Jesus. And we all sit together, and how are you guys doing with Jesus? And, and the dad of the house, oh, we're doing wonderful. And the wife's like, mm-hmm, yeah, wonderful. Let's separate you guys out. Joe, you take her in there, you know, or Mary, you take her in there. Joe, you take him in there, and I'll take, you know, and, and, and they take it separate. So tell me, really, how's the, how is it going? What would people say about you? What would your children say? What would your mom and dad say? What would your brother say about you? Your sister say about you? What would your husband say about you? If that scares us, there's something wrong with our family. There's something wrong with our walk with Jesus. Because as Paul is pointing out, our Christianity needs to start in our homes. And I think that's one of the hugest problems within the church in America today. We're not being careful in our homes. We're not walking after Christ in our homes, which again is the most essential place that we can be walking. And we need to be careful, beloved in Christ, to, to, to have a home that is full of Jesus. And to be honest, you know, if, when those kids grow up and they're in that sort of home, they're the kids that grow up and guess what they do? They walk away from the church. Do you know that some 70 to 80 percent of kids, I think it's actually 80 to 90 now, when they get into high school, or after they graduate from high school into college years, they walk away from any faith in Jesus Christ. It's radically high numbers. Radically high. Why? Because a lot of them are saying, dude, if that's what Christianity is in that home, I don't want it. And if we're honest with ourselves, there's some sitting here today where this is taking place, or taking place maybe even today. We don't remember that Jesus warned not to stumble one of these little ones. Better not to stumble one of these little ones. You know what? Just hop in a boat, go out to the middle of the sea, tie a millstone around your neck, and throw yourself into the sea. That, Jesus said it would be more desirable for us to do that if we're going to cause one of these little ones to stumble. And I believe that that covers our children, by the way. Now, the best way to be a good parent as a Christian is to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God, to be on fire for Jesus, to be a biblical Christian, a biblical man, a biblical woman who is parenting in the name of Jesus Christ for his glory. Can I have an amen? Amen. And, and to be honest, that's the best way to be a Christian wife 
or a Christian husband or a Christian child, and today a Christian parent, to be filled with the Spirit of God continually, to be loving our wives, to be submitting to our husbands, to be leading our, our wives in love in the homes. Children, to be submitting, obeying your mother and father with a blessing. And parents, to be, as, as the NIV says our verse here this morning, fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. A paraphrase says this, parents, don't come down too hard on your children, or you'll crush their spirits. The Amplified says, Fathers, do not provoke or irritate or fret your children. Do not be hard on them or harass them, lest they become discouraged and sullen and morose and feel inferior and frustrated. Do not break their spirits. Now, a lot of us here have grown up in a generation where that was the norm. You broke the spirit of your kids. I remember we had a sweet dog. Everybody used to call him Lassie. His name was Piper, the, just a big, you know, collie, sweetest dog in the world. But I remember my dad took him through training, the dog training. Maybe some of you had done it, but this was back in the 60s. And I, I didn't, never went with him, but I remember my dad saying, yeah, when we went through that, his spirit got broken. And, he, and my dad actually never liked that, never liked it. He said he would never train another dog like that ever. Because Piper was always kind of afraid of everything, always kind of, you know, afraid. And notice that's what it says that we can do when we provoke our children. Here, I like the Amplified. They become discouraged, sullen, morose, feel inferior and frustrated. Their spirits have been broken. Fathers, especially, we are not to be this way. Now, I, don't, I can't speak for everybody here, but I find it quite enlightening that as the Lord is writing through Paul, that he tells guys things. Notice what he tells guys to do. Look back here at verse 19. He says, husbands, love your wives. But then he says, notice what else? Do not be harsh with them. Then he tells them to the fathers, do not provoke your children. You know what that tells us? Do you see a little bit of a pattern there? That tells me that men have a sinful tendency to be harsh unloving and provoking anybody here ever watch america's funniest videos well, we watch it we, we you know it's one of those shows that we can laugh out loud together you know sometimes though they have dads on there doing the meanest things in the world going in and waking up their kids in the middle of the night with a boogie boogie mask and an axe in their hand that's not funny to me that's provoking your children that's 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 putting something in their mind that they're going to remember for the rest of their life. Thanks, Dad. I love you. And then the dad's laughing and sends it into America's Funniest Video. There's his heart for you. God bless you, Dad. And that poor little kid. Sincerely. Dads have a, we have it in us to be harsh, and we need to recognize that. To be, you know, unloving or provoking. Provoking here in the Greek literally means, or literally is erethesite. It's a weird word there, but it literally means this, to stimulate, to provoke, to stir up, to excite, to stir, to anger. Do anyone see that in our culture today? The youth are stirred to anger because we've taken God out of the schools. We've taken God out of the public place. We've taken God out of the politics. We've taken God, for the shame of us, out of even our homes in many cases. Fathers, do not provoke or irritate or fret your children, again in the Amplified. Do not be hard on them, harass them, lest they become discouraged and sullen and morose and feel inferior and frustrated. Do not break their spirits. You know, many think that to gain the respect of their children, they need to be harsh with their children. They need to be mean to their children. They need to be stern. Well, I was raised in the Marines, and that's how it's going to be in the home. You know, I don't know, the last time I looked at the Marines, they were all grown men, weren't they? And women? Anybody? Navy? Army? We can't treat our kids like they're in the Marines. Amen? Oh, it's good enough for me, it's good enough for them. No, it's not good enough for me, it's not good enough for them. You see, these are those that actually want to break their spirits. But this is not what the Lord intends. 
He instead commands father, commands parents, as this same word is translated in Hebrews 11.23, parents, you know, basically not to break the spirits of their children. So this applies firstly to parents, to dads, fathers, but it also applies to moms, because I've seen moms do the same thing. I've seen moms be really harsh with their children, really angry. And you know why? Because those are the seeds that were planted upon us. Amen? They were planted in us. You know, the Bible says that the sins of the grandfather and the father will be what? Visited upon the children. What does that mean? You know, well, there's just some, you know, curse, magical curse that passes down from generation to generation. No. It's that we learn these bad habits. We learn these bad ways of dealing things from our parents. And they learned them from their parents. Well, this is the way that my dad always did it. And look, I turned out okay. Well, ask your wife sometimes. She might say, no, you didn't turn out that great. I love you. But you got a lot of work to go. Amen? All of us, by the way. We're lying to ourselves if we say, no, I'm good. You look in the mirror every morning, dude, I'm great. Look, look at Bill. You're doing awesome, man. It's like, no, dude, I'm a still a sinner. But Jesus, you love me. You haven't given up on me. You're still working in me, you know, for your good pleasure. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you. Thank you that you're still working in and through me. You know, too many have grown up under that, and so now they grow up into that. Now they're a father or a mother that they were discouraged. They were sullen. They were remorse or morose. They were feeling inferior and frustrated. Some of us even sitting here this morning were, had such tough parenting or maybe a surrogate parent or an aunt or an uncle or somebody who raised us that were too hard on us, and they broke us. Maybe you've been broken even here this morning. And our tendency as human beings, we need to understand this, is to propagate it. To pay it forward, if you will. To do the same things without many times even realizing it. You know what the worst thing in the world can be? Is when you're sitting there and you're disciplining one of your kids and you're angry and all of a sudden you say something. You know, like, uh, well, this is my house. If you don't like the rules, there's the door. Right? Right? You know, or we say things, you know, to that effect. And all of a sudden we flash back. It's like, oh, dude, I remember my dad saying that to me. I don't see where it says that in the Bible. You see, I can't tell you how many people I've counseled over the years, for the last 30 years, and that they have had parents that, 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 that broke them. Their mom or their dad or their mom and dad, guess what? They broke their spirits. And they come into the counseling session, and you know what? Even, even some that are older, they're still broken. They're still, there's a part of them even today that still feels broken. And to be honest, if we were all honest, I bet a lot of us would raise our hands today. You don't have to, but that would say, yeah, that was me. You know, it's one of the things that we started praying when. I'll never forget when Micaiah first was born, our first girl. She's, you know, 17 now. And I remember we lifted her up into the Lord in the hospital room. And, and I, one of the things I, I, I prayed then and I continue to pray is, Lord, help me not to be harsh with my baby. Help me to bring her up in your ways, Lord. Help me not to break her. And please, Father, cover any times that I blow it because I know I'm going to blow it. And that's been a continual prayer. And, and, you know, just a side note, that if you have had your spirit broken by a parent or a loved one, maybe it was a teacher or a coach, I, I don't know. But just remember, God, our God is in the business of restoring. Can I have an amen? amen? He restores, the Bible says, what the locusts have eaten. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but that can be a great way to describe perhaps a lot of people's childhoods, that the locusts came in and ate a lot of it away. God can heal. God can restore. That was why Jesus went to the cross. He was broken so that we could be healed. And sometimes that's a physical healing, but every time it can be a spiritual healing. Amen? Amen. Amen. There is always hope at the cross of Jesus Christ. And we need to remember that. Always hope. I don't care if you're 16 or 70 or 80 here this morning. God can bring healing. And I don't know about you, uh, but can I have an amen for this? I'm 52, going on 53. I still feel sometimes like I'm 13 years old. Amen? 
I look in the mirror and I don't fool myself. That ain't no 13-year-old there. I get that. We need to come to the cross, find his everlasting grace, his incomprehensible love, grace, and peace that surpasses all understanding, the Bible tells us. So we're told here that the Christian parent within our text here this morning is not to provoke their children. And I tell you, this, you know, becomes easy to recognize as far as like, you know, am I going to provoke my kids? A lot of ways we can do that. And, and again, there can be many ways, but when your kid comes to ask you for something, you know, moms and dads, you know right away, hey, dad, you know, my girls have gone to the thing where they'll come and they'll start giving me a massage. You know, I'm sitting in my, at my desk and typing or doing whatever, and all of a sudden one comes up from behind and, get, and I start getting a massage. I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, it kind of hurts right there on my neck. Yeah, this feels good. And, and I know something's coming, but I've learned not to say no right away. You got to milk it out a little bit. You know, like work it out. But a lot of times when our kids won't go to ask for something, before they even ask, we're just, no. Amen? We don't even know what they're asking. Mom, can I? No. Dad, can I? No. But I haven't, no, I said. Uh, but I, Dad, no! It's over, that's it, we're done. We talked about it, it's over. But Dad, we didn't even talk about it, man. And they go off to their room, and they're in trouble now because we were being jerks and didn't even let them finish to ask what they wanted to ask. Sometimes it takes some patience, amen, parents? Because they, we know they've asked the same thing 50 times. You just say, look, don't ask me again, or the answer is no. That's it. And if they do ask again, it has to be no. But that's one way that we could, you know, you know, provoke them. We're to be patient with our children. Anybody like it when people are patient with us? I don't know about you, but I love when people are patient with me. When I'm driving down the road and I'm trying to find an address, even if, you know, your phone's telling you to turn here, but you can't turn because there's no road to turn, and you're like, dude, what am I supposed to do? I'm going to end up in the middle. Did you hear about that one? This was a few years ago. Somebody followed their GPS right onto an airport, you know, right into the, I mean, in front of a plane. And, this phone, and somebody else, I think it was in Scotland, ended up in a lake. They just drove right in, dude. I'm like, really? Come on. It's just crazy. But as you're driving and you're trying to find, and you're going a little bit slow, don't you appreciate it when the people behind you are patient with you? But man, doesn't it drive you nuts when somebody's in front of you doing the same thing? Amen? Amen. We want patience. We want people to give us patience and love and grace. But man, you know what? When it comes to our kids, man, we can just lose our patience altogether. What a bummer. That's not the Lord's heart. We're to be patient just with our kids, just like our Heavenly Father is patient with us. Amen? Man, he, talk about patience. If I was my Father in Heaven, I would have sent me to hell a long time ago. Dude, even as a Christian, it's like, what? I, what? We're, we still sin, and I praise the Lord for his patience. We need to show that same patience to our kids, that same love. Another area is we need to be consistent with our kids. I, I, I was older when I got married. I was engaged when I was 21, and then that didn't work out, praise Jesus, because then I met my beautiful wife, Talia. But I was 32, dude, when we got married. So I know what it's like when all of a sudden you're, you know, I'll even minister to the singles. They're, I'm 21 and I'm an old maid. I'm never going to get this. I'm so old. It's like, dude, man, when you get to 32, come and talk to me. You can make it. Paul, and, I, and I'm like this, dude, go get busy for Jesus. Go serve in the mission field. Go serve in the church. If you're not married and you want to be, you know what? That's okay to want to be, but don't let it consume you. There's one fellow, he's a younger fellow I see, I'm friends with on Facebook, and, and sometimes I really just try to be on there to help and to love and to lift up, and, and, and it's so funny, though, every post he's posting, you know, is, he wouldn't even say it, but he, he might not even realize, but it's always about, oh, girls are so, you know, so fickle, and, you know, I uh, can't wait for God to bring me a godly woman, and, and every, it's just like, dude, get, stop being so consumed with, with, with the girl and get consumed with Jesus, man. Be busy for Jesus. When I met Talia, it was in, when we were both in the ministry. I, I had a friend of mine not too long ago, well, it was a few years ago, her husband committed adultery on her, and it, it was like the second or third time that she knew of. 
So she, they got divorced, and you know when I sat down and Celine and I were talking to them, we're like, you know what you got to do? You got to go to your church, get involved in, in your church like you've never gotten involved, dude. Her kids had grown up and were mostly moved out at that point. Even their older kids were like 19, 20 that were at home. I'm like, you get involved in ministry. You get, and then you know what? If God has somebody else for you, he's going to bring him. That's where he's going to bring him. You know what? She went the other way. It's going and hanging out and pretending like she's 18 again and going to the bars and to the different things. And it's so sad. It's so sad. But as parents, we need to be consistent with our kids. And where I was going with that 32-year-old being married, I started looking. The Lord kind of spoke to my heart. Start watching those parents and, and looking what they're doing that's biblical and godly and learn, Bill. Learn, because you're going to get married someday, and you're going to have kids someday, and learn from them. And one of the things I learned was I heard to be consistent. And as I look at God, one of the things I appreciate about the Lord so much is that He is consistent. Amen? He's faithful. Amen? He never changes. I love, I love my God. You know, some people, they get mad at God because he's consistent on sin. He doesn't change about sin, and they think that he should change. They think that he should evolve. I thank the Lord that he doesn't, that he doesn't look at the sins that I used to commit and say, well, Bill, they're okay now, because I know that those sins are wicked and evil and want to enslave me. I don't want to go back there. And I praise Jesus that he doesn't want me to either. So we need to be consistent, and just as God is, with our children. In other words, one day we're not per extremely permissive. Oh, I don't care if you watch TV for 15 hours and go do that. That's wonderful. And the next day, how long have you been watching TV? Oh, 20 minutes. Oh, that's too long. Okay, oh, don't do that. That's like your kids are going, what? What do I do, man? I don't know what to do. Because we let our moods kind of flow with us, and all of a sudden, guess what? We're going from one extreme to another. One day we're so gracious, and the next day it's all legalized. Everything's down instead of being consistent. So we're not provoking our children. We as parents need to be continually encouraging our children, not discouraging them. We as parents need to be continually encouraging our children in the things of the Lord. To grow. Now, it's so funny. We, you know, as parents, you know, I don't know about you, but, I, you know, we think about college, right? You think about school, right? You're praying for that husband or that wife, amen? You're, you're doing all those things. But are we praying, that, Lord, if you want them to be in the ministry, Lord, like deep in it, would they, that they would go? Do we encourage them in that? Are we encouraging them to go on a missions trip? It'd be interesting to go around. How many parents have even gone on a missions trip? Or gone, you know, had their kids. You know what? You need to go on a mission trip. You need to see what it's like on other parts of the world. When I was a little kid, I remember being four or five. My mom and dad, we lived very close to Mexico. In our church, we would take trips down into Mexico. And I remember going in and just going, dude, look at these, all these cool playhouses, all these cardboard shacks. These are cool playhouses. Oh, no, Bill, those are, those are where people live. And I just, I remember being that little, just going, oh, wow. Well, look at that. Dad, can I go play in that, you know, that big ditch, you know, that has the water flowing through it? Oh, no, no, son, because if you look up there, there's pee, people peeing and pooping. And then people down here are coming down and getting their water from the same thing and to go cook their meals. There's a whole other world out there that our kids, for the most part, have no clue about. We need to be bringing them up, encouraging them in the things of the Lord, encouraging them in their dreams. But be careful what we're doing that with, too. You know, we have to be careful where we're sending out our kids today. You know, there was, you know, we just have to be careful. We need to be careful with that. We also need to be spending time with our children, not provoking them into a place of wrath or jealousy or anger as our time is spent elsewhere. You know, basically they, they don't feel very much because mom and dad never pay attention to them. We use the video games now, or we use the television now, we use the movies. Hey, that becomes our babysitter. This ought not to be so, beloved in Christ. We are to not to take time with our kids as it comes, but instead we are to make time with our kids. Can I have an amen? 
Amen. Intentionally be making time with our children. Let them know how much they, that you love them and you value them. Tell them all the time that you love them. Shower them with hugs and kisses and, and, and things that tell, hey, you know what? You are worth. You know why I love you? I can only love you because God loves me. Jesus loved me so much. He died for my sins. That's how I can love you this much. And you know what? You think I love you a lot? Oh, yeah, you guys love me so much. That's a glimpse into the love that God has for you. Amen? I remember the story a friend of ours, Jeff Smith, told years ago. Is his, one of his sons was in Sunday school. He was five or six, and he came home, and he was all shaken up after Sunday school. And he was, you know, Jeff sat down with his son and said, What's wrong? What happened? He's all, Dad, is God always watching me? Well, why do you ask that, you know? And I think it was Brad even. Why are you asking that, Brad? And, 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 he, goes, and he tells Jeff, he goes, well, Dad, I, I was doing stuff in Sunday school today I shouldn't have been doing. And the teacher said, you need to be good because God is always watching you. And Jeff looked at his son and said, you know what? It is true that God's always watching you, but you know why he's always watching you? Because he loves you so much he can't take his eyes off you. That's the love we're to bring to our children. And again, even if we weren't brought up that way, we need to learn what the Bible says. We need to hear what God's Word says. And again, as we're walking with Christ, we're going to be that parent. As we're walking with Jesus, as we're being men and women of the Word, we're just going to be naturally bringing that into our homes. And again, if we're not, there's something wrong. There's, there's styles or things that we've gotten into that we need to repent of. And come to Jesus in a different way, in a new way. Now, just flip on your Bibles real quick, because the Holy Spirit talks a little bit more about this in Ephesians chapter 6. He says basically the same thing, but he adds on a little bit more about children, or excuse me, fathers and parents not provoking their children. In Ephesians chapter 6, let's look at verse 4. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now notice again, the main instruction here is for fathers, but parents are, are included as well. But again, the, the, parent, the father is to be the servant leader in the home, as we covered a couple weeks ago. But again, since this is a divine truth, a divine truth of Scripture, this also applies to moms as well. Do not provoke your children unto anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Notice, we have one negative command, do not provoke your children, and then two positive commands here. Notice the first positive, bring them up in the discipline of the Lord. The second positive is, bring them up in the instruction of the Lord. Notice there with the discipline. We're not to bring them up in the discipline that we were raised up in. Can I have an amen to that? Now, some of you might have had good, godly Christian parents who were biblical and they did raise you up in the discipline of the Lord, but a lot of us, in the guise of we think we're doing that, but because we're not reading the Bibles, we're not walking close with Jesus, we've actually brought them up in the discipline of Bill or somebody else, of, of ourselves. And that's such a sad thing because, man, it, it's, it's never a good thing. We are to bring our children up in the way the Lord shows us. We are to bring them up in the way of the discipline of the Lord. You see, the Bible says if we truly love our children, we will discipline them. Amen? Amen? Anybody been in a store lately where a kid's not disciplined? And Makai was just telling us, you know, she works in a store in the mall, and some little kids came in just yesterday, and they basically literally almost tore the whole shop apart. Her and the manager were doing busy doing other things. They came out, and these two little kids had taken these $30 clothes and put them in the $2 pile and knocked over signs. And mom's just, oh, hi, you know, just no discipline. We see that again, even with what happened in Ferguson. We see it in Baltimore. There's no discipline. You know, but if we love our children, we will bring them up with the discipline of the Lord. Again, not in our discipline, not in the discipline of Dr. Spock or whatever, but in the discipline of the Lord. 
Proverbs 22, 15 says this, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Proverbs 23, uh, 13 and 14, Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with the rod, he will not die. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. Amen? Amen. Proverbs 13, 24, Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Proverbs 29, 15, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Within our culture today, man, this is, people read this, and it is, it is accursed to read what we just read. Maybe some of you in here, you're sitting there, it's like, dude, this is, that sounds harsh. That, that sounds crazy. Within our culture, there have been families that as they practice this, they've been had their kids taken away by CPS or Child Protection Services, whatever it is. And, and it's like simply because they obeyed the scriptures. We are not to spare the rod as parents with our children. If we love them, we will discipline them. We will spank our children. Amen? Amen! Now, it must also be said, though, we don't beat our children. Amen? There's a big difference between beating and spanking. We are not to take out our anger or our wrath on our kids. Can I have an amen? amen? This is such a huge thing. Because what happens is we come home from work, and that whole thing we talked about a week or two ago, we joke, wait till your father gets home. You know, there was a TV show, wait till your father gets, remember? Until your father gets. And I heard that my whole life. Wait till your father gets home. Well, that creates two things that are dangerous, moms out there that are usually saying it. Maybe you're, a, you, know, uh, you know, a dad and you say, wait till your mom gets home. I, but it should be the father who's the main thing. But two dangerous things there, by the way. Number one, it never, there's nothing in the Bible that says only the dad is the disciplinarian, okay? So, but the other thing, when you say that, you, you basically, your husband is coming home from work. And most times when your husband comes home from work, they're pretty tired. And when we come home from work and we have to get our kids in trouble, a lot of times dads have a tendency to take that tiredness or that bitterness or that anger out on their kids. I'm not saying there aren't times you can do that, moms, but be careful of pawning all that off on your husbands. And husbands, if you do come home and you got to get your kids in trouble, maybe you need to take a little time. Have them go sit in their room. Go sit in your room. Dad's got to spend some time with Jesus first, man. I got to recharge my batteries before we deal with this. So you're controlled. You're not, you know, get taking out your anger or your wrath upon your children. And when we do spank them, we're not spanking them to hurt them, to give them scars, to make them bleed. By the way, our discipline is to be reflected through the Word of God. Hebrews 12, 4 says, In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding blood, and you have forgotten that the word of encouragement addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those whom he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Beloved, that's how we're to come to our children in the same heart the Lord has towards us. Our discipline to our kids is to reflect the discipline of the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but when, I, when the Lord's disciplining me, he, he doesn't, you know, make me bleed. He, he doesn't do things like to where it's like going to hurt me beyond repair. And we need to be careful that we don't discipline our kids that way. I tell you what, I still remember to this day some of the things that happened to me when I was a kid growing up, disciplinary-wise. I'll be honest, I think I forget a lot of things, good things that my mom and dad did, but I still remember some of the spankings I got and some of the whoopings I got. Amen? Anybody else? Amen. And it's not good, by the way. I don't look back and go, oh, I can't wait to do that to my kids. It's, I'll never do that to my kids, ever. So I, even when I grew up, man, when I was a Christian, and even still now, I needed, I needed to learn what biblical discipline was as a parent. Amen? 
Parents, man, you need to be learners. You need to be growing in Jesus Christ. You know, so that when our kids were old enough to spank, we would spank them, but it was never to hurt them, only to correct them. Now, spanking can hurt, but we wouldn't spank so hard to where it would sting or where it would really hurt. Again, it was to correct them, and there is a huge difference. And we never give our kids, or gave them, I should say, we've kind of evolved now that they're older past spankings, except for Micaiah, she's 17, so no, just kidding. <laughs> but even then, we'd give them maybe one, two, or three swats on the behind. That's it. Never smack in the face. There's no biblical thing for that. Never smack in the I'm going to hit them on the arms, on the back. There's No, there, there's the, the God made some patting on the rear end for others and just see it sitting. But again, we're doing it not to hurt them, but to correct them. And I'll tell you what, we never hit them so hard to make a mark. Never, ever. Why? Because we wanted to discipline as the Lord disciplines. And as they grew, their discipline would grow. All of a sudden, we'd get more away from the spankings and we'd get into timeouts. We'd get into taking away things. You know, today it's, where's your cell phone? You, you, need to, you can't do this or you can't do that. But, you know, and sometimes even when they did earn a spanking, Usually that, and, and usually Talia and I, there's only a couple reasons for the most part we'd spank them. As that was if they hurt somebody else or they could have, or they hurt themselves, or they could have hurt themselves doing something to where they won't do that again. And we would set them down biblically and say, look, you know, this is what happened. You've sinned. And then they would get two or three spankings, okay? And then, you know, they would go over my knee. And sometimes when that would happen, we'd go over it. Okay, you ready? You understand? Yes, I understand, Dad. And, you know... Um, and, and so we'd, we'd have them to give them the spanking. And then, you know, sometimes I'd go like this. Here's, here's there, I'd go like this. And they'd stand up. And when they first, would, they'd look at me and, is it over? It's like, yeah, I just showed you the same grace that God shows me and you. Jesus took the penalty at the cross. And you know what? That worked just as well as if I were to hit him. I think even better. No matter what the punishment, we always pray afterwards. Always. I'd, I'd, I'd lead them to ask the Lord to forgiveness, and they'd have to go to whoever they hurt. But again, my heart wasn't to discipline them, to break them. It was to correct them in the Lord, to bring them up in the discipline of the Lord Jesus. So many children today are undisciplined in the name of good parenting and, and so-called love, yet the Bible says that this is not love at all. Maybe some of you saw this her heroic mom that's been called in Baltimore, Maryland. You ever, anybody seen the videos of her coming up to her son and, you know, smacking him and hitting him and cussing at him? And, you know, she's been on news things and talk shows. She, you're, she's a hero. Hale, do you know what? Biblically, part of what she did was good going and getting her son. But she shouldn't have been cursing at him, hitting him like that. That's not discipline that we see in the Bible. And we need to be careful with that. Even in the midst of the turmoil, well, there's some good. No, that, that was, you know, that probably is part of the reason he's out doing what he's doing. He's not being disciplined correctly even in the home. And, and again, the mom, if she was doing it biblically, it would have been a totally different thing. Imagine if all the moms in those neighborhoods had come out and stood in front of the police officers, stood in front of the shops. All right, son, you're going to go through me. You going to do that? Imagine if all the dads, there was a sweet thing where there was a whole bunch of guys lined up. I don't know if you saw that picture where they were lined up in front of the police officers trying to protect them from the crowds throwing things. So the first thing is to bring them up in the discipline of the Lord. Now, to be honest, with all this stuff, man, we could dig so much deeper and do days, okay, and do, you know, different breakout sessions and studies and things like that, but we're just kind of, again, skimming that rock. So notice there in Ephesians 6, first, bring them up in the discipline of the Lord. The second positive command is to bring them up in the instruction of the Lord. Now, as Christians, we, you know, we as parents are to be bringing our children up in the ways of the Lord. And again, this starts with the dad. Dads, we have a lot of responsibilities. Our first responsibility is to the Lord Jesus Christ, to be walking with him as his son, as his bride, as his church, 
as our God. But we also need to be loving our wives as Christ loved the church, serving them, even in our leadership within the home, to be Christian leaders, not leaders styled after the world. And we're also to be not being harsh with our children, to be bringing them up in the ways of the Lord. Now, by the way, to bring your kids up in the ways of the Lord, my kids, that's not what Sunday school is for. That's not what the teen fellowship is for. That's your responsibility. That's my responsibility. Sunday school is part of it, a little part. Friday night teen study, a little part. But we need to be moms and dads who are bringing our children up in the ways of the Lord. Turn in your Bibles, please, back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And we'll start in verse 6. Deuteronomy 6, 6. And these words that I command you, they shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. And you shall lie down when, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, there are a lot of Jews today that still will put these little frontlets on their heads or on their arms, and they'll put them on their house. And this is literally saying, as Christians today, this is so applicable, we need to be living out the word of God in our homes. That's what this is saying. We need to be bringing, notice in verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall walk of them and talk of them. Notice, all the time, you're going fishing, that's great, bring your kids fishing, but as you're there, think of things, Lord, how can I bring up things, the truths from your word? How can I be bringing up, and to be honest, if we're not in the word, we're not going to be able to do that. The Lord said to the, the apostles, you know what? Don't, when, you, when you're brought before the, the, the judges, don't worry about what you're going to seek. I'm gonna, I'll bring to mind those things which I have spoken to you. We need to be in, there in his word to remember those things which he has spoken to us. To be a man of the word of God, a woman of the word of God. So that any time we're sitting down with our kids, hey, look at those birds. Isn't that awesome to know that not one bird of the air falls from the, without our Father knowing? And that you know that the Lord has counted every hair on your head. And for some of us, it's a few less hairs to count than others, but he counts them all. He loves you that much. And to use that as an opportunity to do that. Notice, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, in other words, you're living it out continually in your home. You're living it out when you're driving. You're living it out when you're going to Disneyland or wherever you're going. And it's going to be everywhere within your home. In, in Deuteronomy 4, 9, it says, Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, lest they depart from your heart in all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. How on that day you stood before the Lord your God. To be making those things real for our kids. Now this isn't just sitting down and reading the Bibles with them. That's part of it. It's not just praying with them, but it's living out the Christian life so that they're learning from us as they watch us every day. I mentioned, you know, last week or a couple weeks ago that Talia and I, when we argue, we argue in front of our kids most of the times. You know why? Because I never learned how to do it when I was a kid. My mom and dad would go in their bedroom. Talia and I do it in front of our kids to teach them how to argue godly in a godly manner. Not to sin, to be angry, but to sin not. And if we do sin, how to reconcile. So important, guys and gals, that, that we be those men and women who are living it in our homes, making it known to our children, especially, again, in the days that we live. You know, in Psalm 78, 4, where we will not hide from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and His might and the wonders He has done. This has been lost within our culture today. We're not telling the glorious things that the Lord has done. I mean, even with our country. Amen? Dude, I watched some old movie, uh, Huck Finn, uh, with, uh, uh, oh, who's that, the, the short actor that was real popular, Andy Hardy? 
Mickey Rooney. I love Mickey Rooney, love old Mickey Rooney movies. You know, just get some good stuff there. But he was Huck Finn. Well, after it, they had a little short. And it was a short on how we got the Bill of Rights for our country. And it was like showing all these different things, you know, and the fight, a little bit of the fights that they had with the English. And a lot of it, it was, you could put that to today with a lot of what our government's doing today. And why is that? Because, again, we've taken God out of the marketplace. We've taken him out of our schools, out of the education facilities, out of our government. And our, our form of government wasn't meant to be without God. Because all the rights that we have that, we, that show and are given to us by who? By our Creator. Inalienable rights, it says. But even within the church, man, sometimes we love to sit down and tell our kids, man, dude, you, you don't, we shouldn't even be in this house. The Lord has done so many miracles to keep us here. We, we talk about different things that we've had, and, and we, we continue to grow in those areas. So bringing our children up in the instruction of the Lord. Now, we're going to stop right here this morning because I want to continue on this next week. I want to finish this up when, next time I teach. And we're going to finish this part up because I want to finish talking about bringing our kids up in the instruction of the Lord and the admonition of the Lord. And this is a great place that we're going to stop just as we want to finish talking about that and just being the parents that God would have us to be. Let's pray. Father, Thank you that we have your word, Lord, that we don't have to guess about things, Father. What is your will with this? What is your will with that, Lord? Thank you that we can dwell within your presence through your word, Lord. Thank you that as we walk in obedience with your word, Lord, through love, that we find just that deep rivers of abundant water, Lord, abundant life, abundant power. Oh, Father, I pray for a blessing on each person here, Lord. Parents, children, wives, husbands. That you would bless, that you would heal, that you would strengthen, Lord. That we would be those men and women that you're calling us to be, Lord. And that since the days are so short, that we would awaken from our slumber, Lord, and live radically on fire for you, Jesus. And it's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.